speaker this afternoon is uh, David Meeker. David uh, uh, comes to us as uh, Executive Vice President at the National Renderers Association, where he uh, represents the renderers uh, uh, in a legislative and, uh, and regulatory setting. Yeah. He's, uh, David uh, has his PhD, PhD in, uh, I believe, swine, swine production and management, and uh, he's, he's currently worked in the swine industry as well. And um, David, we're glad to have you with us today. His topic is going to be Livestock and Poultry Environmental Learning Center uh, Renderer Requirements. David? Thank you, Mike, and good afternoon. Uh, in my section today, I'd like to speak very briefly about the rendering industry, uh, update you on the feed rule changes from FDA, and uh, then briefly discuss what renders have to do in light of these changes and then what producers can do to, uh, to assist. Um, there's much more information on our website about rendering at nationalrenders.org. Um, what renders do is process dead cattle, trim, and offhaul into animal feeds. And uh, most of this material comes from the slaughter of livestock uh, for food. So uh, only about 5% of all of our raw materials are uh, fallen animals from, from farms and dead stock. So uh, it's a relatively uh, small part of our business, but very significant, very important to our renders. We are regulated by FDA uh, mainly. Uh, FDA has responsibility for animal feed. We also obviously are uh, regulated by EPA. Uh, by state agencies and so on. I um, already covered the website. Okay, we've had a feed rule since 1997. At that time, uh, uh, we were restricted uh, from feeding cattle materials back to cattle, mainly. It's called a ruminant feed ban. Uh, but this uh, requested us to have two streams of rendering, one uh, for cattle materials that would go to animals other than cattle, and then the the regular uh, uh, rendering stream that would be chicken materials and, and pig materials that could be fed to all animals. So uh, that was relatively straightforward and, and it has worked very well uh, for over 10 years and it's been very effective. Uh, just recently in April, um, there's a new twist been added by FDA and uh, uh, I should insert a caveat here that uh, the, the National Runners Association really didn't ask for this change. In fact, we uh, provided lots of different arguments and information uh, to FDA to try to, to show them that this change wasn't needed, but uh, we essentially lost that battle, so we, we, we do have a changed feed rule, and, and now we, uh, we have to comply with it. So what that uh, change is uh, really takes more materials out of the feed chain and, and really causes uh, yet another uh, stream of materials, and this is uh, termed cattle materials prohibited in animal feed, CMPAF, and it essentially is the brain and spinal cord out of any animal 30 months and over. So this particular material can't be fed to any animals. So we have, we have rendered products that can be fed to all animals, rendered products that can be fed to all animals except for cattle, and then now we have a class of materials they cannot be rendered for feed at all. Now, um, renders, uh, as I said, we, we kind of fought the political fight and, uh, and lost, so now we have to comply. And there are several ways to comply. Well, one is to, to just not handle dead cattle uh, or handle dead stock at all. An another way that renders can, can comply is to handle only the younger cattle. And then the, uh, hopefully the, the best way and, and the way that most of them will handle it will be to continue their services uh, as they have, but separate the older cattle and disassemble them as required so that the pro prohibited material is not, does not go into feed. Now, the rule also says that if the brain and spinal cord is not removed from that animal, then the entire animal becomes a prohibited material. So uh, if, if they're not rendered... Um, if the render picks them up as a service and, and cannot process them, then they have a, a pretty big volume of, of disposal material that has to go to a landfill or, or some other process. So uh, our estimate is that uh, of the independent renders, which are already only 30 to 35 percent of the total plants, of, of those that do handle dead stock, 
uh, probably about 70% will attempt to continue their services under, under the conditions that I'll describe. So um, as I said, we have these, these, new, uh, these new requirements and this prohibited material, the term CMPAF by FDA, I'll just call it prohibited material from now on, it has to be removed and separated. So it, it, uh, if it were to be rendered, it could be used for fertilizer and, and fuel probably, but the problem is that there's not very much of this material in any one place, at least not enough to run a whole separate line or have a whole plant. So, so uh, renders also have a bit of a disposal challenge for this separated material. And uh, again, it's, it's only for part of the cattle. It's only for the cattle 30 months of age and, uh, and older. Um, and if they uh, if they uh, if they die, they're subject to uh, special handling by renders. Now, there's there's already um, what's called SRM or specified risk materials in the packing plants because uh, these materials have been uh, prohibited from human food uh, uh, for years now. And the SRM is a larger class of materials. It also includes the brain brain and spinal cord, but also Includes such thing as the eyes, the uh, the uh, dorsal root gang ganglia, um, lymph nodes, and so on. So it's a it's a larger list, a longer list of materials. And up until uh, this rule is is enacted, um, these materials could go to rendering. So we also have a challenge in in slaughter plants, whereas the the, the materials that were prohibited from human food. Part of them are now also prohibited from animal feed. So um, this is a, a, another challenge, and, and, and we have to split the materials coming into rendering. Now, these uh, these pictures depict some of uh, some of the dead stock that our members handle, and actually, these uh, dead stock in this picture are uh, in pretty good shape compared to some of what we see. Uh, part of our challenge now is that uh, since these these uh, carcasses have to be disassembled. Um, they uh, they have to be in pretty good shape. So when the weather's hot or when the weather's really cold, e either extreme or really any time, uh, the renderer needs to be notified immediately after the animal dies. Uh, so we have uh, time to get these carcasses disassembled and processed uh, before uh, uh, deterioration sets in. Well. Um, FDA really doesn't have a test they can run to see if the meat and bone meal has any of the prohibited material in it. So what they are going to do in their inspections of rendering plants is look at records and documentation. So we have to have standard operating procedures of how we're going to do this. And in most cases, the carcass will be hung on a rail, similar to a slaughter plant, but it's already dead, hung on a rail, uh, uh, probably skinned to save the hide, and then eviscerated and split, and then a vacuum will be used to pull out the spinal cord. And uh, obviously it's, a, it's a quite a bit more labor and, and uh, some uh, employee safety issues that we haven't had before, so it's going to increase the cost of handling these carcasses. Once the brain and spinal cord is removed, then the, the rest of the carcass can be used as it, as it always, always has been. So part of the documentation uh, is the age of the cattle, because if they're under 30 months and they don't have to have all these uh, uh, special processes, so they'll just be ground up and, and processed as they always have. So whatever cattle can be documented to be under 30 months, that will save uh, save everybody some money, the producer, the render, and down the chain. So if you have documentation on age, then we're, we're going to ask... Uh, ask you to mark the carcasses. Now, now when I say we, I mean uh, most of the independent renders uh, in the business participated in, in a task force and we developed these procedures. Uh, some may vary from that a little bit depending on their plant and, and the forms may look a little different with their own logo and so forth, but, but I'll go through what, what our committee decided. It, it should be close to what people are expecting. So, um, as I said, we'll provide some uh, the, the renderer will provide some paperwork, and, and you can fill it out and uh, uh, offer up information that, that might be helpful. Um, one of the important things uh, to do between now and, and, and 
October. The rule was enacted in April, but we have six months uh, to uh, to get ready, and and it will not be enforced until April, uh, uh, excuse me October 26. So between now and October, uh, better sooner than later. You should talk to your render. If you have rendering service now, you should talk to the render and see what conditions uh, are going to be like. Uh, Make sure that they're going to continue the service and then uh, take a look at the paperwork you need to provide. This is what it looks like. Um, don't worry about reading this. I'll go through the important steps one at a time here. The rather simple information, do you raise, feed, or own cattle that are 30 months of age or older? Just a yes or no question. If, if you don't even handle or raise cattle to this age, then you can simply say no. Um, fill out the rest of the documentation to be on file, and that's it. Um, going further, if you do have uh, cattle, do you have uh, records uh, that you can uh, verify the age of these cattle? Um, records uh, do need to be kept on file for a year. Answer no on that question. And then another question on records is do you have it for all the cattle or just part of the cattle? The kind of information that members have to keep on file. Then uh, if you have records to determine the younger cattle, are you willing to mark these carcasses? Yes or no question. And then we, uh, we looked at several ways to, uh, to mark carcasses and settled on a fairly simple way of using an orange paint stick uh, or another color if you don't have orange, but use a paint, paint stick to put an X on the side of the older cattle. 30 months and older, and a U on the side of the younger cattle. So it looks something like this on a live cattle. And if the age is uncertain, uh, don't mark and don't guess on the age. What the renters have to do is if, uh, if the age cannot be documented, then they, they, uh, they, have, to, uh, they have to assume that the that the bovine is 30 months or older, unless they can use dentition by the teeth or, you know, if it's an obviously a uh, very small, young-looking animal, they could assume it's a calf. But in most cases, if it's uh, anywhere near uh, the size of a, of a mature animal, they're going to have to assume it's over if they don't have age documentation. And older cattle may incur a higher fee for rendering. Uh, as I mentioned, they're, they're going to be uh, more labor involved and uh, more procedures to follow and more records and all of that. So uh, it could cost more to have that older bovine rendered. But uh, resist the temptation to uh, just call them all young because that's not going to work either. You, you have to be uh, truthful in declaring the age of cattle and uh, be, uh, there's some more legal language on that a little later. Uh, bottom of the form is uh, your, your, your name, um, email, contact information, and so forth, pretty normal stuff. Now, um, the back of the form has some of the, some of the legal language on it. Um, and you do have a legal ob obligation to be truthful on these forms. Uh, this uh, statement constitutes a uh, statement that's uh, used by FDA and, uh, and will be inspected and verified by FDA. So, uh, uh, if you uh, aren't truthful on the uh, form, it's not just uh, telling a lie to the renderer, but it's uh, lying to the FDA, and those penalties are fairly serious. So if you don't have the information, just uh, say you don't have the information, and everybody can assume that's an older cow. There are, uh, there are some fairly severe penalties for that. Okay, um, further on in this, uh, in this webcast, there will be... Uh, some other alternatives discussed. Um, there are uh, ways to get rid of uh, fallen livestock other than rendering. Uh, there's burial, landfill, composting, incineration, and alkaline hydrolysis, like which is used in some of the diagnostic labs and so forth. Um, we do believe, and, and many others agree, that rendering is the most suitable technology for uh, animal health, for the environment, and uh, so on. But in some cases, we, we realize that it's not available. Long term, we're hoping um, to improve these services. We are 
trying to work with USDA and EPA to find out if there's a, a way to make permitting uh, plants a little easier, uh, a way to channel all dead stock and, and all non-feed organic materials uh, to a rendering stream. If we had enough material, we probably could make it economical to have some special plants for that kind of material. That's kind of a long-term uh, process to, to get anything like that developed, but that's something that we are working on. Um, there are some nice papers uh, put out by uh, CAST just recently, and it's available on, on their website. Uh, the website address at the bottom of the page, but there's uh, papers came out in the last year on uh, ruminant carcasses, poultry carcasses, and swine carcasses, and they briefly describe all the different kinds of uh, disposal options for you there. So that uh, that wraps up my slides, and uh, when the time comes, I'll do my best on your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. That was uh, that was very informative. Um, in in following up to Dr. Meeker's presentation, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Parker uh, is going to uh, discuss with us some of the issues related to to uh, disposal of uh, of um, some of these questionable animals, these 30-month-plus animals. Uh, in, in beef operations. Um, Dr. Parker is uh, currently the